So let me introduce myself and talk a little bit more than I've kindly been introduced. So let me explain why the hell I'm on stage. Originally, I was a marine biologist. So many years ago, I wanted to be Jack Cousteau. But it was really hard work. And you got cold, and you had to spend a lot of time in cold water. And then I discovered computers. So I actually discovered computers because I'm essentially very, very lazy. And um, I heard a speech that said, whenever you want to hire, if you want the most efficient company, always hire lazy people. Because lazy people will find the most efficient way to do things. Um, and that suited me and what I wanted to do. So I moved from being a marine biologist into being a software engineer. And um, through my, my career, I've pretty much, I've started four different companies. Um, I've kind of worked with payments since uh, they were kind of typed them into a machine um, to where they are now. So I'm fascinated by a number of things. I'm fascinated by biology, and I'm fascinated by technology. And as you can see above, I'm a Douglas Adams fan, so also. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the evolution of man, because I truly believe we're at a stage now where we're on the edge of man changing to a new, new period. We're actually becoming something different. So if you think, when is the last time that mankind actually changed, became a different, a different group? And it was a long, long, long time ago. And really, the only difference that's happened over the last you know, hundreds of years is some people in the audience have got less hairy. Not me, but some people. So I believe that we're at that stage now where you're actually going to see evolution change who we are and what we are as people. And I think that's because of technology and what technology is happening. So before we go there, I'm going to talk about splice. And splice in, in biology and splice in DNA is when you combine two different things to make something new. So I'm going to talk about some areas where I see technology and biology splice in human beings. So let's talk a little bit to start with about identity. Who are you? And identity has changed an awful lot with the invention of the internet, because everyone in this room is a liar, by the way, just in case. Don't be upset. You're all liars, because you all have four different identities you use on the internet, whether you know it or not. You have the real identity, who you really are. You'll have a social identity, who you would like to be. But most of us are a lot more good looking, have a lot more girlfriends, and are a lot more popular online than we are in real life. So you have this identity that you portray out there, and then you have your real identity. And these two identities kind of play against each other. And there's also something called perceived identity, which is what you believe yourself to be, not necessarily what other people see. All these identities merge together. And when it comes to the internet, then they actually, actually form something interesting. And that's something that's to do with your mobile phone, because there's a game. So I was in a bar a while ago, I won't tell exactly when, and I met a girl. And this girl asked me for her wallet, or asked me for my wallet. So all of you, this story does not end the way you think it ends, OK? <laughs> and I was interested, so I gave the girl my wallet. And she took all of my business cards, all of my cards, everything out of my wallet, and she put it on the table. And she said, let me tell you about yourself. And so she went through all my membership cards, things to do, and she tried to analyze who I, were, who I am. She got pretty close, and she gave me back my wallet. Thank you. Um, but actually, there's another game you can play here. So take your mobile phone and then analyze what apps you've got on your phone, because they say a lot about who you are. So this is my phone. So I have 21 travel apps on my phone. I have five airline apps, eight taxi apps, eight other travel apps. I have 18 technology apps, nine fitness apps, nine social apps, three children's apps, four music apps, four film apps, six payment apps, two events apps, and just two security apps. Yes, I know I should delete some apps. I understand. But what does this mean? And when you look at it, what does this say about me as a person? This tells you I travel a lot. Straight away, you can see by just looking at my phone that I travel an awful lot. You can also see by the amount of technology apps on there that I probably work in technology. Based on the children's apps there, you can tell that I have one or more children. And because of the number of payments apps, you can probably tell that I work in a payments area. So just by looking at the apps on my phone, you can learn a lot about me. Now imagine if those apps on the phone could do something different. Imagine if those apps on the phone could talk to other apps on the phone. And this is an area that we haven't really explored very well. Wouldn't it be so much better if your apps actually shared the information that they know about you with other apps, which will then make your life more efficient? Imagine what you could do here. 
Imagine if, when you got off your airplane, when you landed, your flight apps, or something like TripIt, t looked up the local taxi app and gave you the local version of Uber. I wouldn't need 18 apps. The apps could talk to each other. They know where I am. My phone knows I am. The phone knows I'm not at home. So why doesn't that app tell the other app I need a taxi and get me the local taxi company? The same way, when I'm listening to an audio book while I'm driving in the car, or maybe I'm reading a book, when I get into the car and plug my phone into my car, why can't my one app say something like, you know, my Kindle reader, say to something like Audible, this is where he was in that book, and this is where you need to continue the audio? Why don't the apps talk to each other? Because I think actually there's a lot of power there. So I have to do a little bit of talking about PayPal, otherwise I get in trouble because it's my job. <laughs> But really, so this is something that we've done recently. We've released a, a product called OneTouch, um, PayPal OneTouch through, through Braintree, who we acquired earlier in the year. And what OneTouch does is it knows which PayPal or payment apps you've got on your phone. So it knows if you've got Venmo, which is a, a social payment app that we got, or if you've got PayPal. Now, if you go to any site that takes PayPal, like Airbnb or Uber, when you click on Pay, that app says, is there a PayPal app on this phone? Yes, there is. Is this person registered? Yes, they are. OK, they've paid. So basically, the two apps have talked to each other. You don't need to log in. You don't need to give a password, because the apps know each other exist, and they know they trust each other. Wouldn't it be so much better if all apps do that? So what I'm saying here is the first splice of technology and biology is your device is now part of your identity. What you carry on your device is as good as your face when it comes to recognition, or perhaps your fingerprint, because it's actually got a fingerprint of who you are on the device that you're carrying. And actually, your phone is probably more honest than you are, as I tried to explain earlier. Let's move on. There's a difference between identity and authorization. Or you identify yourself and you authorize yourself. They're not the same things. But often people say this is an identity solution. It's not. It's an authorization solution. It's a solution that says, I give permission. And this is when we come to login. So this is another area where I think biology can definitely help us. So where do you keep the most honest record of yourself? I guarantee all of you have your bank details up to date. I guarantee all of you have got the right address in your bank account. And you keep make sure that's kept clear, and they have the right email address, because that's where your money is. And you care about your money. So that's the one area you actually probably update first when you move house, et cetera. Now, if you can link into that true identity and authority, which is what we've done with our systems, we can say this person is really who they say they are. And that authorizes you to do things. So identity and authority are not the same thing. Authority needs to be backed by a true identity. And in our view at PayPal, that true identity, unfortunately, is not your social networks. It's actually something really boring, like your bank. So that's another part of this. Now, when you're ready to expose yourself to say, here I am, this is when it gets really exciting, because this, this, uh, this slide is always really disappointing, because I'm always looking for the S, and it's not there. Um, this is an identity crisis, by the way, what you're seeing here. But, um, <laughs> When it gets really exciting is, how do you all identify yourself at the moment? What is the most common way of identifying yourself? And sadly, it's passwords. I really hate passwords. And let me tell you why I hate passwords. 4.7% of people who use passwords, password is password. 8.5% of people who use passwords Password is password or one, two, three, four, five, six. Nine point seven percent of people who use passwords. Password is password one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's nearly ten percent of people. All right, that's really depressing. Fourteen percent of people password is listed in the top 10 passwords used in the world. So you can fish 14% of people by using 10 guesses, right? 40, 40% of people's password is listed in the top 100 passwords. 79% of people's password is listed in the top 500 passwords. 91% of people's password is listed in the top 1,000 passwords that people use. 
Now, I'm a programmer, and I used to be a bit of a hacker. That's a really easy problem to solve, right? I can test this really quickly. So passwords kind of suck. And the reason they suck is, on average, every single person here has 60 passwords, 60 passwords. And you're never going to use 60 different passwords. Unless you use a password tool, you're not going to remember them. So essentially, the system is self-defeating, because it requires you to cut down your passwords because you can't remember them. And ultimately, you end up with this horrible situation where essentially passwords are extremely hackable and extremely easy to defeat. The only thing in their favor at the moment is there's so many people, it's a bit of work to hack someone. But if you really want to get into, into someone's computer, with that level, you know, with a 1,000 guesses, you could probably get 91% of people. This, this is not good. So what's the alternative to passwords? And I'm, I really believe in biometrics. I believe that we, we're getting there with biometrics. So if you've seen with any of the Samsung new devices, you can pay with PayPal with your fingerprint. I think that's one way to do it. And obviously, with iPhones, you can use the fingerprint to log in. But there's some other really cool stuff that's going on at the moment. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the Nimi device, Nimi device. This actually monitors your heartbeat directly from your wrist. And your heartbeat is unique to you. It's as unique to you as a fingerprint. It's actually more unique to you than a fingerprint. So using this device, this can actually monitor your heart rate. And using that heart rate pattern, actually authenticate yourself. So they built something called Heart ID. So using this, there is an API. And you can use this device to authenticate yourself based on your heart rate. This, I have one of these at home. This is fun. I have two of these at home. I have one of these so I can play a Star Wars game where I try and lift a ball up and down with my brain. But this is actually a more evolved version. This actually uses brain waves. Um, you're able to use this device to control things with brain waves. And actually, brain waves are a very good way of authenticating someone because everyone's brain waves are different. So much so that this device, um, or similar device, is being tested currently with the cars for, for a large security company. Because you put this device on, the car will not start unless it's monitoring your brain waves. So you know, I can cut your hang hand off if I want to steal your fingerprint, but I can't cut your head off because your brain won't work anymore. So um, this device actually can allow you to, to, to secure, authenticate yourself. Now, yes, this is a bit ugly at the moment. You probably aren't going to walk around wearing this on your head. But funnily enough, um, I was amongst all the people that laughed at the Sony smart wig when they, uh, they launched a patent uh, uh, last year, actually, for a Sony smart wig. But when you think about it, actually, that makes quite a lot of sense. If this is now going to have brain sensors built into a smart wig and allow you to control things using your brain. The other scary thing about this is I was reading an article the other day where a bunch of research scientists managed to put this device onto someone's head and then by asking the right questions, hacked their password. So because it can read the brain waves and the responses, they were actually able to work out what someone's password was using one of these. So there's all kinds of horrible torture um, implementations there. But I actually think these things are quite exciting. And they're, they're quite affordable now. So if you're like me, you're a geek, and you like to play with toys, um, they're, they're only about you know, 100 euros now. You can get one of these with an API and allow you to actually start playing around with brain waves. Once you've authenticated yourself using, using uh, biology, hopefully, then you need to broadcast yourself. So one of the interesting things that happened, who here finds it really hard to remember people's names? It's got much harder, by the way. So I used to remember people's names a lot better than I do now. And I always, everybody blames it because I'm getting old. Actually, since the invention of social networks, it's been shown that people remember less names than they did because your brain is only set up to remember a finite number of people. I can't remember the exact number, but it's something like 160 people you can actually remember. And now that we've increased our social networks to such a level that we know so many more people know in a, in a digital fashion, actually we're getting a lot worse at actually remembering what people are called. Now, if you can broadcast your identity, in the old days you broadcast your identity by showing your face, but if you can broadcast your identity, then actually you can get rid of that problem. And I was talking to a very cool startup in Silicon Valley the other day. They've actually built a system for finding people you want to talk to based on, um, based on basically a digital identity and GPS location. So who's seen this film, Minority Report? OK, so there's this bit in Minority Report where Tom Cruise walks into it. All the devices, all the holograms in the shop wake up and say, welcome to the store. Um, you, last time you were here, you bought a cardigan or something like that. And he's panicking because he's being chased and he doesn't want people to know who he is. But actually, this is reality already. And this is happening already thanks to beacons. 
So beacons are out there. So PayPal has a beacon called the PayPal beacon. There's other beacons, Estimote, et cetera. But beacons actually allow you to broadcast directly from your cell phone or directly from one of the devices to the cell phone, depending on how you configure it. You can say, I am here. I am, I am, this is me, I am here. With a PayPal system, basically it says, this is me, I am here, I'm ready to pay for stuff. So I can walk into a store that's got a PayPal beacon in it, pick something off the shelf, wave at the person until and walk out, because the store knows I'm here based on beacon technology. So essentially, biology and beacons, all this can combine to that next site. And that's that your body will actually authenticate your identity and then you'll be broadcast, your identity will be broadcasted for the purposes of commerce and efficiency. So actually your body will say, I'm me, I'm the real person, and I'm here. And all of that will be triggered by your body and then broadcasted through something like an eye beacon. So let's talk a little bit about senses. So senses traditionally are set, the five senses you have, they say any of the difficulties like sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch, with, by which humans and animals perceive stimuli originating, originating from outside or inside the body. Those are the traditional senses. We all say we have five senses. So what the hell are these? What are these things that we're wearing on us? We're wearing watches, we're wearing glasses, we're wearing wristbands, GPS. Our body doesn't have a sense for detecting where we are. But if you wear a GPS device, your body knows where you are. Now you'll say to me, wait a second, John. You still use your senses, you still use your eyes, or you still use your ears to identify it. Not necessarily anymore, because there's a scary new bit of technology called embeddables. Who's heard of embeddables? Okay, so it's not enough to wear your devices anymore. You now have to put them in your body. Okay, this is a contact lens. Google have invented a contact lens that you put in your glasses, that me in your eyes, that measure the blood sugar in your body, so in case you have diabetes and can detect whether you need to get some insulin. But even better, actually, they've replaced the insides of eyes now with technology that has allowed blind people to see. So they've actually managed to embed technology into an eye to get someone to be able to see with it. These aren't the headphones, I just like this slide. But what they've also tested recently is they put magnets inside someone's head and each ear actually inside the ear. And then they broadcasted music directly to the magnets. So you can listen to music without any headphones. And actually it's built into your head. So you've got inbuilt headphones. It's kind of cool. A little bit scary, kind of cool. <laughs> this isn't one, but there's um, already now there's been developed smart tattoos. So you've probably read in Snow Crash and others, people wearing smart tattoos, they already exist. So smart tattoos are out there. A number of companies testing these at the moment. These actually mod mod uh, measure um, ambient things around you. They can measure sunlight. They actually can measure things like sweat, whether you're hot, whether you're cold. But smart tattoos are actually getting more and more popular now. They're not permanent. They're not like you know, tattoos I have. But they're actually smart tattoos. They stick on. They're part of your skin. And they become monitors to actually tell you what's going on in your body. Now is my scariest one. Motorola make, not this one, Motorola make a pill. Google own Motorola. So there's now a Google pill. So you, you can eat this pill and it actually fits um, RFID or NFC into your body. So you're able to use this to identify yourself by taking a pill. Um, not sure I'd try that one. But um, this leads you on to the next thing and that's basically, you know, the age of the nano is close. Already we're getting smaller and smaller machines. Already we're getting parts of technology embedded into our bodies. And this is actually there. Embeddables are happening now. There's a professor at University of Reading that actually got himself chipped. So he was able to walk around the office, um, around the university opening doors. More impressively, he managed to get his wife chipped so she could do the same. I think my wife would knock my teeth out if I tried that, but hey, we can always try. So my next view is splice number three. You're gonna have more than five senses. I would argue we already have more than five senses, but very, very soon, the world of five senses is going away. You're going to have many more senses, as many senses as you can imagine, and these will feed back directly to the body, not through a phone or through something else. They'll actually give you impulses. So if you haven't eaten enough of something, you could be made to feel hungry. Already we have things that stimulate taste. You have electrodes you can attach to your tongue to actually taste different art articles. So you can use this electrode to taste something and it makes it feel sweet or makes it feel sour. We're already at the stage where we actually can control those senses or even bypass the senses completely. 
All of this is going to require a hell of a lot of data. And the data is one of those things that's out there. So storing data is one of those problems that we, we're still suffering from. Data storage, processing um, things fast enough is still a bit of a limitation of how fast we can go with technology. And there's a diff load of different places you can store data. We've tried tapes. I'm so old, I remember tapes. Um, you can try it on you know, CD-ROMs. You can get hard drives, all the rest of it. There's something that actually is really interesting, and that's this, DNA. So DNA itself is a, one of the best data storage mechanisms out there. And it's been used, of course it is. It's how we exist. It's how every organism on this planet transmits data about who it is and what it is. Now, imagine using DNA to store other data. And that's happened already. So already a university, at EBI, um, a, a research division of EBI, EBI in the UK, has managed to encode I Have a Dream, the Martin Luther King speech, into DNA. They've recorded it in DNA, and they've actually managed to play it back from DNA. So this is not the best quality, but it's happened already. And so DNA can be used to store a variety of different things. Actually, DNA is so good at storage that there's approximately three zettabytes of data in the world. That's a, it's an approximation of all the data that exists on the planet. Now, if you encoded three zettabytes of data into DNA, you could put it in the back of this truck. Every piece of information that exists in the world could be stored in the back of a truck like this. Now, the interesting thing about DNA is it replicates. So you use RNA, and you can self-replicate. You can take DNA, and you can make more DNA. So actually, as a data storage tool, it self-backs up. Right? It's the backup solution that does it itself. Interestingly enough, however, why we exist and why evolution happens is because DNA mutates. So what's going to happen if we actually start putting data in DNA and it mutates? We're going to end up with some really interesting stuff going on. Now, I don't imagine you will not use your own DNA. I guarantee you will not use your own DNA to store data because you need it. It kind of makes you exist. However, using DNA, there's no reason we couldn't build a storage organism using DNA. And there's no reason our bodies couldn't feed that the nut nutrients it needs, like the blood, the food, oxygen. And you could actually store that storage mechanism on yourself. So there's no reason you couldn't be carrying out your own personal DNA hard drive. Again, a little scary. So my tech splice four, DNA will be used to store data. And natural mutations will create interesting things. That's the bit I'm most excited about. Of course, you're going to need backup. Of course, you're going to need a place to put things. And you could keep on talking about this subject. And I want to leave a few minutes for questions. You could, of course, I know a number of you have read sci-fi. You can tell I read sci-fi. There's a lot of things that you spend a lot of time thinking about. And wouldn't it be really nice if you could outsource those thoughts to the cloud? Wouldn't it be really nice if you could extend your brain by having parts of your brain sitting in the cloud? So here's a search. What the hell is that girl's name I met in the bar who, who borrowed my wallet? I don't know. I could go onto Google. I could go into LinkedIn, Facebook. I could spend hours doing it. Or I could ask my cloud-based brain who was that girl I met in the bar the other night, and then leave it to go off and do that. I think that's already getting to the stage where we can get to that. We're outsourcing part of it. We're actually naturally doing it anyway, using, using computers and using mobiles, et cetera. But it would be good if we could do that. And when I say cloud, you also need a central point for things to happen. And this is where I believe payments needs to go. Because the more and more of your body is getting involved in it, and the more and more of things that you own do things for you, the more you need somewhere to make them access the secure data. When I'm talking secure data, I mean payments in this case. So I believe, you know, we have a saying, we have this thing saying, spend less time paying, spend more time playing. And that's kind of what we're trying to do at PayPal and Braintree is we're trying to take away the things in your life that waste so much time, the boring things. Who here likes shopping? Anyone? Only two people like shopping. Come on, I don't believe you. Who here likes playing? Paying for shopping. No? No one like paying? See, it's the shittiest thing about shopping is paying. No one enjoys paying for stuff. And you want the worst thing? When you go into a store, they make you queue up to pay for stuff. That makes no sense at all. Why are they making the worst thing the thing you spend the most time doing? Get rid of it. Make it invisible. Take everything away. Make the boring bits go away. Give you more time to play. And by doing that, we, we, our belief for PayPal is we make payments so invisible, and this is what we're working, working on at the moment, because you won't even notice they happen. They're just part of your day to life. And we're going to do that by putting the wallet in the cloud, which is where PayPal sits. 
then each of these smart augmentations, these wearables, smart devices, whether it's your fridge, your car, anything else, will talk to the cloud to get permission. Say, OK, who made this? My biology says, I made this, is my choice. And then the wallet in the cloud makes the transaction for you. And that's where we believe we're going. A lot of this stuff is very sinister. And I think you think what ha happened to the Neanderthals, right, when Homo erectus came along. They got wiped out. They got kicked out. We didn't evolve from them, in case you haven't read the press release. Um, we wiped them out because they were weaker. Now, I think as a responsibility as technologists, every day we must take the responsibility for what we do. If we become faster, quicker thinking, more agile digital human beings, We've got to remember that not everyone is going to come as fast as we do. And we need to be responsible and look after those people. I think it's something that, honestly, as technologists, we sit there and we often say, there is a problem. We need to solve that problem. We don't often say, should we solve that problem? And I'm seeing this happen a lot. You're seeing this happen a lot in Silicon Valley, where problems are getting solved at, to the detriment of, detriment of actual people. And I think as human beings, we must Remember that we're still human beings. If we become the next stage of evolution, we become these digital creatures, let's remember to keep human values and actually look after other men. So my final message is, be a good cyborg. Don't be a bad cyborg. Thank you. Thank you, John. So while trying to be good cyborgs, we have a few questions. Um, actually, a few people would really like to know where, from where you have those password statistics. Uh, th there's a survey published every year um, that basically is run by a few different security companies. Um, they run this, and then they <laughs> expose these statistics just to scare people. OK. <laughs> and then an interesting question. Who should think about privacy, privacy and ethical boundaries? Governments, companies, only users? Tech people don't like to talk about this part, but the solution should include their opinion too. No, exactly. I, think, I don't think it should be government. I really don't think it should be government. Um, I, I don't think it should be companies either. I think individuals need to know how much their data is worth. So every time I get a cold call on a phone and they say, I'd like to run a survey, I always say, how much will you pay me? And that stops them straight away, because your data is actually valuable. It's something that you own. It's a commodity. So don't give it away cheap. Make sure you get benefits back from it. Okay. And then interesting question about which technology do you personally think will be the most important in 2015 for humankind? Um, at the moment, I'm really, I think, well, for humankind, that's a big, big, big question. Um, hopefully, it's something that makes hunger go away, but I don't think so. I think for, as a nerd, I think brainwave technology is something I'm going to play with a lot this year. Brainwave technology? All right. Hi. Um, you talked about uh, the splicing of tech uh, with, the, with the body, um, you didn't really touch on sort of what medical technology may do to our own natural bodies in terms of increasing our ability to think or our perception um, or improving what we really have, like laser eye surgery and stuff like that. My question is more touching on looking towards sort of 100 years, 200 years out. Do you see a separation of um, society with the people who have been enhanced and now so much more advanced than those that don't. I mean, you touched on it, um, but do you think that's going to happen? I think, um, like most things, 100 years is probably a long time in technology. So I think mo by that stage, most people will be enhanced. I think you'll get to the point where it's a detriment not to be enhanced. And then you, know, you might end up with you know, people living in communities where they don't want to be enhanced. But I, just, I think we're already getting to the stage where if you don't have a smartphone, you're already starting to lose out, and I think that's going to move even faster. Uh, there is a question regarding a DNA storage. How would the DNA storage work or look like? Could you give a specific example? I think it's a tough question, though. <laughs> well, at the moment, it's all in test tubes. So <laughs> it's not very sexy. But uh, you know, essentially, if you could put this into some form of organism, um, it could be something that you could add grafted to you at, that, at, at a really hyper scary sci-fi moment. But even in a basic, you can store DNA in test tubes. So you could just store it in a gene bank. You could store it like they store genes today. They're storing most, most of the world's plants in gene banks. You could store your data in a gene bank. That's going to happen sooner. But actually, in carrying it around with you, I don't see any reason. You know, it needs oxygen, it needs blood. You could do that. Okay. Maybe last question because we're out of time and it's related still to payment, so maybe it answers the third connection. Um, 
I'm sorry, but what again is so unsecure with current payment methods? That's the time to scare people. What is unsecure with current payment methods? Um, it depends which current payments. Putting money under your bed is insecure because your house might burn down. Does that help? <laughs> um, credit card numbers can be stolen. Um, it's, not, it's not purely about security, it's about use. It's about actually how, what's easy. Is it easy to go and do something? Can you make it easier? Can you make it more invisible? So it's not about whether they're secure or not. It's more about actually do they waste too much time because it's not something I want to spend my time doing. <laughs>